buen día. Feliz Navidad. Welcome to Conversaciones de Salud. My name is Carmen Robles. I'm your hostess welcoming you to snowy Minnesota. I appreciate this opportunity to be with colleagues here and share a conversation that's really super important on health, but to also share on the, on the beauty of uh, a book that Ruben Rosario, our guest, has written. I want to immediately thank our supporters, our sponsors, uh, the production team here at SPIN, thank you so very much, um, ORN, the Opioid Response Network, uh, of course, Cajitas Cafe, which we ran out of. We were hoping to raffle some out, but we'll have to wait on that. I'd like to say hello and thank you to the Department of Human Services, Recovery Cafe. And uh, we're going to uh, start with our guest. I have Joy Tong here. She's my assistant in helping with the Zoom and with the uh, presentation of this project. From Mexico, I present to you our virtual assistant, Paulina este, Lopez Valencia, and I welcome our studio audience. Uh, we're sparse here, but full of energy and full of love. And I want to thank Juanita Espinosa from our native community that's here, and uh, Douglas from the University of Minnesota, and also Tasha from Recovery Cafe. And so uh, I'm Carmen Robles, your hostess, and we the most the hostess with the mostess. And so I'd like to introduce to you a, um, a icon in our community. Oh, and I also want to say hello to Mr. Hansen who's uh, virtually, and he's uh, our teacher partner over at Mendota Heights Twin Rivers. Hi, Mr. Hansen. And I believe Elsa Perez Vega is uh, somewhere. She was gonna do the introduction, but I think she may be stuck in traffic or stuck in the virtual world. So I'm gonna go right ahead and introduce Ruben Rosario. It's, uh, it's a little bit, um, uh, you know, he, he's, he's a renowned journalist, and so he has a, a wonderful background, and he's a veteran newspaper journalist who wrote an award-winning column for the St. Paul, Paul Pioneer Press. He was born in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and raised in New York City, I think the Bronx. Ruben has spent 11 years as a staff writer for the New York Daily News, covering some of the biggest and most notorious crime stories in the nation's largest city. Along with vet veteran print and radio journalist, journalist Ron Howell, Rosario lobbied to open the Daily Tabloid's first bureau office in Harlem in 1982. And that covered the often neglected communities in Upper Manhattan and the Bronx. In 1966, in 1986, Ruben wrote Journey into the Den of Lost Souls. This newspaper account documented the emergence and devastation of crack cocaine in Harlem and poor city neighborhoods. It earned him praise from local politicians and the New York Police Department. He went on to cover stories for national magazines, including the now defunct Nuestro and Crime Beat. Rosario joined the Pioneer Press in 1991 and worked five years as the city editor and public safety team leader. He also established and coordinated several newsroom intern pro internship programs designed to increase the presence of up and coming journalists including those from underrepresented racial ethnic groups. Rosario launched his award-winning column in 1997. He was named a finalist for the 2008 ASNE Batten Medal and was also selected Best Reason to Read the Pioneer Press by City Pages, the Twin Cities Alternative Weekly, in its annual Best of the Twin Cities edition. The Weekly also named him Best Columnist in the Twin Cities in 1999 and 2003. He received the National Alliance on Mental Health Illness of Minnesota's Media, Media Advocacy Award in 2009 for columns on the issue. He also won first place honors multiple times since 2001 in the annual Minnesota SPJ Page One competition. 
His last first place award took place in 2021 for entries that included his column on the George Floyd murder. He was also recognized in 1999 with the Anna Quindlen Award for Excellence for his series on columns of, on Minnesota's child protection system. In 2000, Ruben Rosario received the National Council on Crime and Delinquency Pass Award for an in-depth look at Minnesota, at a Minnesota early intervention program that targets juvenile delinquents under 10. Ruben received the third annual Access to Justice Award from the Minnesota Hispan Hispanic Bar Association in 2004 for his columns. Along with 12 other Minnesotans, Ruben was honored in 2006 with the first annual Minnesota Latino Achievement Award. Also in 2006, Ruben received the Voice of the Community Award from the Immigrant Law Center of Minnesota for his body of work surrounding immigrant issues. Ruben left full-time employment with the Pioneer Press in April of 2020 after 28 years. He still writes an occasional column for the newspaper and other media outlets. His book, Deadline Minnesota, is a collection of favorite columns and was published in 2020. Ruben Rosario is a longtime member of the National Association of Hispanic Journalists. He, he's also treasurer for the Criminal Justice Journalist, journalist a, a Washington DC based national organization of crime reporters and editors. A married father of two, Ruben Rosario is a survivor of both childhood sexual abuse and stage three multiple myeloma, a treatable but incurable cancer. Uh, it's with great pleasure that I introduce to you Ruben Rosario and welcome you to the SPIN studio offices where we're gonna have a little conversation about all your many awards and how did a guy from Brooklyn coming from uh, Puerto Rico uh, wind up doing this? And we have Joy Tang here, who's going to be working with Paulina and uh, Alina in Mexico. And they're going to be uh, sharing any Zoom calls or any comments. Hi, Elsa. Bienvenida. I just want to say something about Ruben because okay. back in 2020, when he came, to the St. Paul Pioneer Press, I was like so overwhelmed. Fighting the issues in the community, standing up for our community was important. And when I saw that Ruben came on, I saw that it was going to be inclusive, it was going to be sensitive, and it would be representative. So not only is he a leader in journalism, he's a warrior, he's uh, accomplished so much, but his most important works are his beautiful wife and his son, who I know is an upcoming journalist. So Ruben, welcome. And, oh, yeah, he's Puerto Rican. <laughs> <laughs> no. Gracias, Gracias. Para que lo sepa. Gracias, Elsa. I'm so glad Gracias. that uh, you were able to uh, virtually join us. I know you, you yes. were going to be here, uh, <laughs> but the weather and circumstance, but uh, from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank you. Did you know that is, uh, Juanita Espinosa is also here? Yes, uh, yes, I know. Excellent. And we also have Elvis. Uh, Rivera. Eh, All aquí. right, Elvis. <laughs> y, y, se, ¿Y te recuerda de Joy? Mm -hmm. uh, no, I don't, but I, hi, Joy. Uh, Elsa, Gladys Dime. y Chino. Oh, yes, I do know you. Es que, mija, no te parece. I love you. I know, I know. <laughs> she was, uh, it's another one that you've mentored through the years. Uh, Elsa Vega Perez. Yeah, she's uh, quite the, the leader here in, Saint, in um, the state of Minnesota and also a mentor of mine. Yes, she so, is. No, you're the one. You. That, <laughs> yeah, usted la que, sí. La, no, no, la, no, no. No, 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 pero hablamos eso, that's another show. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and so I, I wanted to share the conversation with Joy and, and with Ruben, and uh, we wanted to talk about bringing awareness to uh, my, myeloma cancer, mm -hmm. uh, but mostly we just wanted to be joyous with you and, and, and have you entertain us and, <laughs> okay. and, and give us all your best. Uh, so would you like to, to begin the conversation, Joy? <laughs> sure, sure, Ruben. 
Uh, it's a little quiet in the chat, but uh, <laughs> I will begin with um, your book. Okay. Let's, let's begin with there. Um, I um, had the pleasure of meeting Ruben about three months back. And he signed, autographed his book for me, and I went home and I read it. And I, I did not know the history or this acclaimed man here that we are celebrating today. Um, and as I was reading, there were just so many connections within the book from, you know, my mother here. She was a Hennepin County social worker. And you opened with so many things that I, I just, it brought me back to being raised that, you know, in that mm -hmm. sort of environment because, you know, we are the product of what our parents do. So if she was a social worker, I was a social worker by trade, you know, right. by, by all of that. And you, you really br uh, brought in some great stories of some of uh, the writings that you put in the paper. Would you like to talk about one of your favorites? One of, those? one of my favorites. Well, it, it's like asking who's your favorite uh, child <laughs> yeah. um, from 1997 until April 2020. I wrote over 2,100 columns mm. for the Pioneer Press. Usually it was twice a week, and they were mostly reported columns. They weren't like, I'm going to sit back and uh, I'm going to give you an opinion of where I think about something, write a little bit, and go on and have lunch. It was just going out there, talking to people, telling their stories, bringing the issues, um, social justice, human interest, immigration, mm -hmm. law enforcement, and other issues, uh, but putting a human face on them. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I had to, I always wanted to put a little collection of columns into a book form. And so I had to go from <laughs> 2,100 columns to 65, which <laughs> make up uh, the book that you have in your hands Correct. right now. Correct. Um, so favorites, they're all favorites. They're all. I mean, you know, from the sad to the sublime to the happy to the joyful to the tragic, they all are kind of little, my baby. They touch kind of. a chord. They, they touch, touch a chord. chord. Here's, yes. you've got one here. Mom takes blame system didn't help. Mm -hmm. And when I read this, um, it's a January 18, 1998 story. I'll let you share a little bit of that. Well, Desi Irvin was a three-year-old girl in Minneapolis, and she was found unconscious, not breathing in her family's apartment um, that day. And an autopsy revealed that she had numerous uh, fractures in her body, it's on her bones were calcified, um, and this was a three-year-old girl, and it turns out that her mother had essentially beaten her to the point of death. And at that time, the Minnesota's child protection system, because of the laws that they had put in place, uh, we could not, we, and I'm just a proxy for the public, um, as journalists, journalists usually are, we kind of find out what the backdrop of calls to social service agencies had happened before. Was there any intervention involved? Was there any intervention for the mother who had suffered from childhood sexual abuse herself and from substance abuse? And I believe there were three other daughters, so she was one yes. of four. Mm -hmm. She may have been the youngest. And so I followed this death. I followed it from, from the Minneapolis cop who wrote uh, um, in his report how he found this child wearing, uh, I think it was Bugs Bunny pajamas or something. And he's just describing as she's laying in the city morgue. Mm -hmm. You know, this little, this little kid just wearing pajamas and a kid that should not be in a, a place like this. Right. And, and so I got a little passionate about it because... It, did the system fail? Did the family, of course, the mother failed by, you know. And uh, so I wrote about the death. I wrote about the mom's problems. I wrote about the lack of public transparency in finding out what, you know, what happened before we find this girl lying in, in a slab in the city morgue. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I decided, you know, the best thing to do is go down and talk to the source. So I went down to the woman's prison in Shakopee and spoke to the mom. Yeah. And the mom was very honest about what happened in her life, what led to her. I mean, she owned up to the fact that she 
was responsible for her daughter's yep. death. And I think I led the column saying that uh, one of the treasured possessions in Mildred Irvin's prison cell in Shakopee is a picture of the daughter that she killed. Mm -hmm. You know, and the two of them are lying, I think in the picnic area or something. And she, she didn't want to blame the system, but it, she mentioned that she had gone to rehab several times mm -hmm. and played the game, the system game, the program. And, and she said that she wasn't ready, even though a judge uh, moved to release her from rehab, that she wasn't ready. Mm -hmm. But of course she said she was, mm -hmm. and she got drunk that same night yeah. when she got out. But it, it was, as a result of the column I was told by a couple of the legislators um, that the head of a child protection in Hennepin County was on my side. He wanted to bring out the record about whether the government agency had, had been involved in this child's mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. He couldn't because of the laws that we had at that time. Correct. Well, the laws were changed and it led to something called CHIPS Correct. where the, uh, the public is able, I think even now, is able to go and review, either sit in or review documents called child and neo protection hearings. Correct. And that should be statewide now, but Correct. that was one of the counts. Yeah, oh, and I love this because uh, we have uh, in my family, um, something happened to an extended relative along this line. Mm -hmm. And uh, to your point, I'm very supportive of CHIPS. I think that there does need to be some transparency, not just here, but it just broadens the conversation that this is larger than just our community. Mm -hmm. This is happening in America on a global level. And, you know, I, I think we, it was a good reminder of community you know, that see, say, see something, say, say something, something, lean in, mm -hmm. you know. Um, our children are our, our blessings and our assets. That's our future. Yep. Correct. And they're so, also a pain in the neck. No. <laughs> so uh, one of my favorite stories. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and um, Hi, Dr. Fiol. Como estas? How nice to see you. Uh, uh, one of my favorite stories was the one on opioids. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it was about the... Uh, the grandmothers? Yes. Yeah. Uh, because uh, I, I, that's the kind of work that I'm working on is opioids, uh, substance use disorder, and the mental health. Mm -hmm. And so it was so, uh, you know, the reality of that, that same subject. We hear it's a crisis. We hear uh, we have colleagues here that work directly with that. Mm -hmm. And we're still uh, at, at, at that very... Uh, front stage. Uh, another thing about your stories that I I, I, I cried through most of them. I, I mm -hmm. couldn't uh, because it's real, and uh, but it was your personal stories and your personal battle. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wonder if we could speak on that for a few minutes, and then we'll have Dr. Fiol uh, saludarte porque él está este, ansioso para saludarte. Sí, claro, lo conozco muy bien. Sí. Um, well, I, I can talk about the health and the childhood sexual abuse. Um, Please. With the health, um, that's been described, I'm a uh, survivor of cancer, uh, barely. Uh, <laughs> back in 2011, um, I was diagnosed with uh, multiple myeloma, stage three, which is the most critical terminal stage. I had never heard of this cancer before. You heard Lung cancer, colon cancer, what the heck is multiple myeloma? Is it? Well, it's, it's uh, uh, cancer cells in your, in your plasma, oh. which makes up the blood and also helps in combating infections. Oh. So basically, at the time that I was diagnosed, 80% of my plasma cells in my bone marrow were cancerous. Um, and these are the things that help fight infections and disease. So I would would be vulnerable, immunocompromised to anything. I mean, it could be a cold, cold mm -hmm. could put me out, things like that. And I was diagnosed, unfortunately or fortunately, <laughs> was diagnosed on April Fool's Day, about two months after a buddy of mine, uh, this, as I was going for a layup, playing basketball down at the downtown Y, slammed me a little too hard against the wall and I fell and I couldn't like breathe for a little bit. 
And usually, you know, things like that happen when you're playing, but it lingered. Uh, I was felt fatigue, I felt shortness of breath. And finally, long story short, uh, after I woke up feeling like somebody had just stabbed me in the back, and I went to urgent care, one of the uh, physician assistants said, well, let me take a blood test, found my hemoglobin down to like four or five when it should be like 13 or 17 and suspected that that's why I had. And a biopsy later uh, confirmed that I had uh, multiple myeloma. And long story short, a year and a half of chemo, mm -hmm. two um, stem cell transplants mm -hmm. where they take out your blood cells out of your body completely, zap you with the most toxic mm -hmm. chemotherapy you can get, mm -hmm. and then put these uh, cells back after they've cleaned them. It's almost like rebooting a computer, <laughs> except I'm the computer. <laughs> and uh, I went through two bouts of that, um, and you have to be semi-quarantined for a couple of months. You can't be near people, all that. So three bouts of pneumonia, septic shock, a rupture appendix, mm -hmm. while I was getting chemotherapy. Um, all kinds of stuff throughout the past 10 years. And it's been like since 2019, where after taking a daily pill called Revlimid from October 2012 to this summer, every day, mm. which by the way, a 28 uh, pill supply for a month retails for $22,000, oh. oh okay? Goodness. Which is kind of, if you want to say anything about the American healthcare system, <laughs> Yeah. That's pretty much it. It's it's outrageous, uh, and where you have I, and the out of pocket. Uh, even though I had good employees subsidized insurance, there were years during the past ten years where I was paying fifteen to eighteen thousand dollars out of my own pockets, a nice chunk of it through my retirement savings, mm -hmm. just to take care of the out of pocket. Mm -hmm. um, so, but that's another story. Yes, that is another story. But anyway, this mm -hmm. summer, um, my oncologist uh, from Methodist Hospital in St. Louis Park noticed there was a spike back of the cells. Because it has no cure, I always have the cancer. It's just that these pills and my treatment helped put it dormant mm -hmm. for nearly 10 years. Mm -hmm. But it spiked back up this summer. So I'm, since October, I've been going through weekly uh, chemotherapy, antibody, injection treatment. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, it'll go back down again, and maybe I can kick around for a few more years. Uh -huh. I hope so. That's what yes, so. for yes. sure. And, and how about the stem cell? Um, stem cell, right? We, and, and it's not it's not a, a bone marrow transplant. Mm -hmm. It's they take my own blood, my own blood, and and take it out of my body, clean it up, and then put it back in. Yeah. Wow, I am yeah, speechless. <laughs> um, uh, Dr. Fiorno, ¿usted tiene algo para decir sobre lo que Rubén dijo en estos momentos? Hola, Rubén. Hola, Miguel. So, I know I've just been sick. Of course, you, you had MM, we call it multiple myeloma thing. But, you know, it, I, it's curious I'm looking at, and some people... In stage one, like you mentioned, will have just an increase in some of the gamma globulin. So it's called a monoclonal gammaopathy. And it's just maybe the beginning, and then it kind of flares up. It's a strange disease. Uh, and like you said, it affects just the specific cells in your bone marrow called the plasma cells. And they have to do with immunity. So fighting infections and, and gets defective. But there's wonderful chemotherapy. And the last few years, uh, I follow a little bit because I deal with brain cancer and there is some relationship, not for you, but in the genetics of the two conditions, there have been some points pointing fingers at. But there is a wonderful chemotherapy and you look good. I look at tall makeup. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> movie camera. I think they're not right until Carmen. <laughs> No, but I'm eager to, I mean, you're to, to read it. You, you're a wonderful writer. You know, we follow your work in Campo Pioneer Press. You've been great, great help to the Puerto Rican community. I know in over the years, 
And Elsa, isn't that right? Every time we go to Ruben, he comes forth and helps us with, you know, announcements and things. So you're a Puerto Rican fighter, so I, 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 you're, you're going to keep going. I know that. And congratulations on your book. I'm dying to read it. We Where can you get it? Uh, is it in Amazon or places? Where can you get your book? We have a copy for you, Dr. Fiol, so no se apure. Oh, okay. Sí, sí. Okay. <laughs> y, y thank you. Thank you. Y también, yeah, thank you. Uh, wow, what a great achievement the book. I know, yeah. right? And he's very inspirational, but I'll speak on that in a moment. So, Ruben, um, in, in looking at this extreme uh, challenge, and, and I know you like to hoop. I was, I was thinking I should hoop to for my stress, but I don't know what hooping is. Oh, okay. And so uh, if you could share a little bit of how, how, how do you keep that, uh, la ganas mm -hmm. and, and that positive attitude when you have every right not to be? And, and so I, I wonder if you could share a little bit of that. Well, when I was diagnosed, it, it's a shock, right? Surprise, mm -hmm. you're like, I have cancer? Like that's for other people. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know exactly. Um, what I, I don't want to be a member of this club. No, I neither. Yeah. But um, I never say why me. Right. Yeah. I still haven't, and uh, I think it's more of a stress um, and more of a burden, not for me because I'm the patient, mm -hmm. right? I'm the one that's getting all the medical mm -hmm. attention. Mm -hmm. For the caretaker mm -hmm. and for your family members and those very close mm -hmm. to you, I think it's more stressful. Yes. Uh, because my, my worry was, okay, I got this. I got to do my will. Yeah. I got to do my funeral arrangements. I got to get my little cherry wood cremation box ready, which is down in the basement oh, wow. for the past seven years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, get everything in order so that if I take off and my ticket gets punched by whomever is out there, that I'll leave them in some sense of financial security, everything's prepared, all the passwords, they got the passes, the flash drives. I mean, you know, you, you get See? into that like prepared mode, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. So you don't think too much about yourself, you're just the patient, okay, I'll go through these treatments. Uh, but for my wife and for my son and for my daughter who lives in Arizona, I think the burden, the mental burden is a little more for them. Uh, and for me, it's like, my philosophy is today, right now, this morning, right now, this minute, this second, there is a child being born that's not going to live to see the sunset, mm -hmm. okay? I've lived 68, going on 69 in February. I've lived a very good life. I've <laughs> lived what probably 100 years ago was a very long life. Um, I've had my fun. I've eaten my desserts. I, I've had, I've cried, I've laughed, I've experienced loss, I experienced happiness. Um, so if my ticket gets punched by this or anything else, I've had a good life. But for me, my thoughts go, okay, I'm going through this. There are people that are dealing with worse stuff than I am. And I got treatment. I'm getting treatment. Mm -hmm. There are people around the world that will never get treatment. Mm -hmm. There are mm -hmm. people right now in this country mm -hmm. that have inadequate treatment. People that are afraid to go to clinic because of their status or because they don't have money. People that are taking their lives because they're leaving bills unpaid, mm -hmm. medical, which I think is just absolutely insane, mm -hmm. especially in supposedly the richest mm -hmm. country in the world. You know what I mean? Oh, yes, so I I'm fortunate. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I've been very fortunate. That's the way I look at it, you know? Yes, yes. I, and if I call the hoop a couple more days, yeah, I'm like, hey, hey hoop, hoop. It's, is that like crochet? You know what, it's, 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 it's playing basketball, you know? <laughs> yes, that I figured, you know. If they, but I'm from Brooklyn, and I should have known que, okay. que es the hoop. Uh, so I'm a breast cancer survivor, and uh, I so agree with you when they said you have breast cancer. I just went somewhere else, and I'm like, mm -hmm. not me. And... Uh, and like you, I had, and I wonder if it's a cultural thing or if it's a, a humanity thing or a Latino thing about being grateful for whatever it is you have because it was caught 
Uh, it, uh, it, 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 it's an opportunity to share the ups and downs. Uh, it, with your type of cancer, is there any like uh, warning signs or any, any? It's, it's a little tough because um, it, like I said before, you start feeling fatigue, if you feel shortness of breath. Um, it, it, in some people, it metastasizes. For mine, mm -hmm. has a metastasized, which is great. Yes. But for some people, uh, it, it gets into different parts mm -hmm. of the bone in, in your body. Uh, one thing I didn't mention is one of the symptoms is after I did that layup and my body slammed me into the wall, I had an x-ray and they found fractures in my spinal column, in my vertebrae, uh, which is another telltale sign that something else was going on. Because it wasn't just the slam that did that. There was something already that had uh, led to the fractures in my spinal column. Um, uh, so fatigue, shortness of breath, uh, loss of weight, very anemic uh, are some of the symptoms of multiple myeloma. I mean, we also have Dr. Uh, Alfonso Morales who just walked Morales. in. Morales, yes. Hola, so please direct your so, questions to our doctors. On the medical side, I'm listening to this and you're right, there's very minimal signs, right, or the tells, right, because separately, oh, it's dis easily dismissed, but once you group mm -hmm. them together, then you start to get your math equation. Mm -hmm. A plus B is leading you to C, correct? But I'm wondering, you know, when we talk about the resilience of, you know, you're the victim, you're the patient, you know, this sort of thing, but it's really the family mm -hmm. who's taken on all of these things, sure. you know, just kind of turning some questions, opening it up for our doctors, because I'm wondering, is there a genetic component? Is there something else that kind of helps, or, you know, are certain people predisposed? Yeah, it, it's it's still a mystery. There, there are some people that might genetically inherit, but my understanding is that most do not, that most is, it's environmental oh. also, and it could be also uh, genetic in the terms of, of mutations within your DNA. Okay. Um, that for some reason, it happens, it happens to you. Okay, that's um, the science. But, Those are for our experts, the science of mm -hmm. behind all of this. Yeah, no, I, I'd like to say a little bit about that. There's, uh, I, uh, toxicity of the environment, there's no question about that. There's not a, really a genetic predisposition, it's just the environment that we're on. And unfortunately, thank you. You can see this happen uh, in areas of pollution or larger cities where there's more chemicals. Uh, we've seen multiple myeloma also from our vets coming uh, back from the Middle East when they were exposed, especially in the Persian Gulf War. Uh, so uh, that's where we saw an uptick of of this multiple myeloma, but it's uh, it's and then of course there's uh, immunity as well, the immune system being down for various reasons, stress and and uh, obesity as well can do that, but more more so it's it's environmental. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Alfonso, could you please just give us a uh, quickie of what it is that that you do in your uh, medical? Yes, uh, so I'm a uh, family medicine doctor. I, I was trained in uh, Virginia. My dad is a cancer surgeon. He was here in, in the University of Minnesota. And then I, I switched my practice in the early 2000s into uh, pain and addiction. I just saw there's a tremendous need for patients, not only in chronic pain, but who had addiction and the interface of both. And uh, over the last few years, I've also kind of moved quite a bit into the wellness prevention, being more, I think uh, one of the problems of our country's healthcare system is we're very reactive and not proactive. We don't, I mean, how can we prevent diseases like the chronic diseases we see here, like diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and certain cancers, which are quite preventable. Mm -hmm. For me personally, and thank you for being here, all of you, uh, it's is to have the conversation so that we're not scared to, to, if we have that bump or if somebody, you know, does, uh, the best thing that happened to you was that day hooping. When yeah, I, 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 I always appreciative of my buddy for driving me to the wall, yes. 
<laughs> and uh, so I, I really want to thank uh, Dr. Morales. He's joining us with the opioids uh, and, and uh, substance use disorder, mental health trauma, which is, mm. uh, you know, because our families go through that mental health oh, yeah. and trauma. And, uh, and, and it's hard to, to accept, for me, it was hard to accept the help because I felt like I had to go into a cocoon mm -hmm. and, and just kind of self whatever. And, and all I did really was just disrespect uh, those mm -hmm. who love me and, and wanted to, to, help. to help. Yeah, right. so my apologies, but that's, that's how yeah. it goes. And I think that's why we need these conversations so that we can you know, accept that love that's given. Right. And and because uh, because as caretakers we're used to you know taking care of you, and right. when someone takes care of me, it's like no, it's it's not it's not possible, it's not feasible. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to piggyback on what the the good doctor said about the. Uh, I'm a member of the Angel Foundation's mm -hmm. Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Steering Committee, and uh, it's an organization, a nonprofit that helps uh, not only patients, but families of cancer patients in a variety of manners, financial, mm -hmm. emotional. Um, when I was going through my chemotherapy, uh, my young son was around 10, 11 years old. And uh, children have a way of hiding their emotions, but you can't hide when your grades go from A to D or A to C. And I understood then that though he was saying, okay, yeah, I'm okay, I'm okay. Daddy, when are you gonna die? I'm not dying. Oh, okay. Um, this foundation was able to, um, once I found out about it, they had summer camps, they had uh, throughout the year activities for young children. So he can see that he wasn't the only one who had a parent who was going through cancer and they, he wasn't the only child mm -hmm. dealing with the emotional roller coaster that that brings in, within a family. And so as part of a member, a volunteer member, we are doing as much, um, I and others are trying as much outreach because we do know about the disparities in treatment, the disparity in access to treatment. And one of the good things that I was told about the Angel Foundation, which is based here in the Twin Cities, and was founded by the wife of an oncologist, is that um, they don't ask for status. They don't ask for status when you apply for financial aid or you apply for any kind of recourse or, or uh, sources, uh, financial, whatever, what your citizen status is or whatever it is. They just look at you as a human being in need. Um, so that was one of the things that I like about this foundation and it's also emblematic that there are all the organizations out there uh, that are that have these resources. The problem is getting the people from our communities, the BIPOC communities, to navigate, to get to know about. And so what we're trying to do is we go out to festivals, um, we try to reach out, and instead of giving out a little brochure, and then of course the brochure goes in the trash, that we actually make face-to-face -face contact because people in my community like talking to people, not texting, not brochures. We they want they want that human connection, yeah, right? We have exactly. to trust, uh, and I think that's why it's so important for you to lead your voice uh, in this journey uh, because people you uh, they trust you, as, as you heard from our guests. Um, they, you build a, a solid foundation. And so people are more apt to have that conversation, that sure. difficult conversation, which leads to other health conversations. Sure. And, and I think we're kind of sort of running out of time, but I wanted to ask Joy if she had anything that you'd like to, uh, I know that you've been poring over his book. It's a tearjerker, right? I do. I would say let's close with, you know, keeping uh, on the same of, you know, oh. inclusion. You know, um, you closed your book with a great story, a refugee story um, that touched a funny bone. Um, and, and then you had a really, a really great, wrapped it up uh, with a great uh, message of change regarding George Floyd. Mm. Do you, does that ring a bell or do you want me to 
give well, hint it, a little bit more. Well, the column of George Floyd, actually, I have been re retired two Correct. months before Correct. the George Floyd incident took place. And as a, any journalist will tell you, you retired two months too early. <laughs> because if there was any kind of coverage or any kind of incident that spoke or, or cried out, for perspective and understanding and insight and investigative, it, it was, was that you. incident that we all saw, the right. world saw, right. happening in front of their eyes. But from you, the and, storyteller. And so guess what? You, you know who tipped me off to the video? Because uh -uh. I, I, I don't I, remember the name, but you said it in your book, your right. friend, well, yes. Well, it, I, I'm retired, and the great thing about retiring is that you don't have to put an alarm clock on in the morning. You can just open your eyes and you're there. You know what I mean? You don't need to be somewhere if you don't need to be. Well, I get a text. Hey, did you see the video? No. What video? It's terrible. It's disturbing. I'll send it to you. So this person sends it to me. And it's no words. I'm, I'm looking at it. I'm going, this is outrageous. This, what, what happened here? Well, the person who tipped me off to the video, tipped me off to the George Floyd incident, was a, a former St. Paul police officer mm -hmm. by the name of Tony Spencer. Mm -hmm. I had known Spencer a couple years before when he was part of a group of police officers who responded to a scene of a suspicious man with a gun on the east side of St. Paul. The man who was being suspected of being in this gun, of course, having this gun, of course, was a mistaken identity. His name was Frank Baker. He was sitting smoking a joint in his truck in the parking lot behind his home. You know, that's not the worst crime in the world. But some cops mistook him for this guy. They were looking armed with a gun. Long story short, he gets pulled out. He gets slammed to the ground. Police dog come and pretty much tears, chews up his leg. And this is a guy who, you know, wasn't doing anything except smoking a joint. Anyway, Spencer was among those who responded to this. Oh, he was also kicked repeatedly in the chest area because supposedly he wasn't complying with orders. Spencer and, and his partner uh, uh, saw this. They, they weren't involved in the beating or in the, the actual arrest, but they were on the periphery. They were so outraged by it, they sent angry emails to the, to the supervisor of, of what they saw their own, their own fellow cops were doing to this guy. And uh, his partner actually jumped in the ambulance to accompany Mr. Baker down to Regions where they found out he had both collapsed lungs, numerous fractures, uh, it, it, terrible trauma to his legs. Frank Baker was awarded $2.2 million in a civil settlement, the city of St. Paul. And Spencer, um, I told him, about, well, I'm gonna write a column about Baker. I'm gonna go up and see Baker. Uh, because Spencer, for some reason, had reached out to me because he had read my columns. And so I said, "What? Well, I'm going to go up to see if I can talk to Mr. Baker um, because I'm doing the column on, on the civil settlement and all that. And I had talked to uh, Mr. Baker's lawyer, who I knew, mm -hmm. who gave me the, the whole the spiel. One -on -one. And my column on Baker actually was published the day before the city decided to settle <laughs> the 2.2 million because I wrote about you know, how outrageous it was. And I wrote about Tony Spencer, who decided to leave the St. Paul, not only leave the St. Paul Police Department, something that he loved, he dreamed of ever, but he also testified mm -hmm. against some of the cops in administrative hearing, which is like Unheard breaking the, the Break, blue wall silence, the cold silence. So uh, I'm getting the thing that we have like a minute left. Oh, okay. Well, long story short, Baker finally meets Spencer in the parking lot, they embrace. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was, that's the guy who took me off to the George Floyd. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Nice. And wow. just, and I brought that up just be, as a reminder, we're all well aware, 
But yes, inclusion, it is very important for us to not just speak about, you know, our Latino community, exactly. but we need to extend, we need to join hands and embrace all of our communities, whether it's the indigenous community, whether it's the African American right. community, we must all come together because we are, we are desperately wanting that change for us as human beings, not as an ethnicity. And that's the bottom Thank line you. here, right. is humanity. Unfortunately, right. I think we're out of time. Uh, I wanted to say hello to Mr. Hansen. He, he spoke earlier. Elsa Vega Perez, what can I say? I got to do a show with you, nena. We got 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Fiol, este, muchas gracias. Uh, Dr. Morales, muchísimas gracias. Tasha. Thank you. Doug. Uh, Juanita Espinosa, Elvis Rivera, gracias, and of course, Joy, and uh, Ruben Rosario. I hope we can do this again. Uh, we'll, Anytime. Let's please keep the conversation going because uh, we cannot leave this world without leaving our fingerprint. And, and perhaps that's why you, you were given this gift of, uh, of challenges to, to share. So I want to thank everybody. Uh, I want to wish everyone a Feliz Navidad. Prospero año y felicidad, and to be safe and be happy and leave all the baggage at the door and walk in with love in your heart, and it's going to be amazing how the world will shift. So muchísimas gracias, Paulina, gracias de México. Oh, Mr. Hansen, por favor, say goodbye to Ruben. No, Ruben. <laughs> hey, I'm in, the, I'm in the middle of a class. <laughs> But uh, I did want to, everybody to know and, and also to let him know, um, he goes beyond Masaya, the muchos, he did. He helped a former Alma student, Rodolfo Lodesma. I'm, I'm, he will not forget the name, I know. But because of what he wrote in the paper and his help with that family, someone that needed it so much as a child is now doing wonderful and great as a young adult. And a lot of that happened because of the article that he wrote and the help he went when he went to visit his father as well. Um, it was a huge thing and he's done other things from my Alma's program, my Alma's kids as well. And que Dios bendiga. Le bendiga, por favor. January 2nd at 5.30 here at Two Rivers High School, a student-led student professional anti-vaping video um, that's going to be released and probably, hopefully, go national. Wonderful. Manda nuevo. Sí, vamos. And everyone's invited. By the okay. Okay. I'll be there. Okay. Muchísimas gracias, right. Spin. Uh, thank you very much for the wonderful work that you do in our community. Uh, Latinos, poor people, we love to, you know, 2 o'clock in the morning, turn on Spin and see somebody that we know. So thank you very much for your support, Orn. Uh, DHS and uh, um, uh, Recovery Cafe, uh, our Dakota Nation. Thank you so much, University of Minnesota. And Elsa, te llamo. Este. <laughs> Gracias, Paulino. Paulina. Thank you very much. Happy New Year. Thank you.